Good afternoon. If you would turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, and we'll be looking at uh, chapter 3, and especially verse 16, but we'll read verses uh, 14 to 16. 1 Timothy 3, starting at verse 14. And this is uh, Paul speaking. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, Proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Amen. And today, uh, our signpost, where are we going? If you had one takeaway from our sermon today, it is this. To carefully consider the relationship between theology and godliness. Or doctrine and practice. Or what we believe and our efforts to become more holy. What is that connection? What is that relationship between those two things? And that's what our signpost is. And uh, to do this, we're going to go ahead and look at the context very broadly, first of all, and then we'll zoom in to our passage, just verse 16. So let's talk about the context, first of all, just of the whole book. So the, fir- the book of First Timothy is written by Paul. And Paul would go through on his missionary journeys, and he would plant a church. And then he would move on, and he would plant another church. And then he'd move on and plant another church. And sometimes these churches would have very big issues, very difficult things that would happen in them once Paul had left. And so this, this uh, letter right here, the, the context is that the church in Ephesus was having a lot of issues. There was these false leaders that were coming in and teaching di- wrong doctrine. And so Paul sends Timothy over to Ephesus to deal with these problems. And so while... Uh, Timothy is in Ephesus. Paul writes him this letter and tells him some instructions on what to do. So that's the context of this book. And so you can see just in verse in chapter one of this book, Paul points out something very, uh, very important. He says that the teachings of the false teachers lead not to godliness and those who hear it, but speculation. And he says, he counters, and he says, true biblical teaching does not lead to speculation about the truth. It leads to, and he says, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. See, the difference of the two different teachings is the result that's seen in those who hear the teaching. And then in chapter 2, you can see there's some different specific issues that Paul deals with. He'll talk about prayer and public prayer. Uh, There's this group of men in the church that is always quarreling and angry, and and he addresses that. And there's also a group of women who are very wealthy, and they're flaunting their riches over the poor people in the church. And also this group of women is usurping the authority structure at the church in Ephesus. And so then we get to chapter 3. And you'll see, you'll probably recognize in the very beginning of chapter 3, you see the qualifications for elders and then the qualifications for deacons. And the context, I think, helps us understand why Paul does this. He shows us what good leadership looks like, and he gives the qualifications for biblical leadership. All right, so now we arrive at our immediate context, what we read, verse 14 to 16. So Paul says that he hopes to come to Ephesus too, soon as well. Paul wants to come to Ephesus and help Timothy uh, deal with these issues, but he says, I might be delayed. And so he says, I just gave you a lot of instructions, and if you read on in 1 Timothy, more instructions on what to do. And he says, if I'm delayed, this will help you. These instructions and this letter will help you if I'm not able to come. And uh, he, he says that these instructions will help the believers there know how to behave in the church. <laughs> behave in the church, which we could also call godliness. How to be godly in the context of a local church. And he calls this household of God uh, the church. And that's where we get the analogy of a church family, the household of God. Paul uses that analogy sometimes of a family um, with the church. And then he says something very interesting. He says that the church is the pillar and the buttress of truth. 
Okay, I think we all know what a pillar is. It holds up a building, right? But what in the world is a buttress? <laughs> it's kind of an interesting word. And um, it really what it is is this, it's this kind of projecting arch that goes out from the outside of a building to support the building. It's seen in like medieval cathedrals or Gothic architecture. Um, and I looked at all the translations. The ESV is the only one to use the word buttress. Uh, here's what all the other translations use for this word. They'll say support or bulwark or foundation or base or ground. So I think you get the idea. Paul is saying here that the church is the pillar and the support of truth. All right. The church upholds the truth. Now you might be thinking to yourself, shouldn't it be the other way around? Isn't it the truth that upholds the church, not the church that upholds the truth? Okay, that's true. The truth is what upholds the church in a certain sense. But if we see in our context, the Ephesians were getting away from the truth of the gospel. And so Paul points out this aspect, that the church is supposed to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. Uh, John Stott says this better than I. He says, the church depends on the truth for its existence. The truth depends on the church for its defense and proclamation. All right, so then we get to verse 16. Verse 16, we're gonna, I'll talk about some comments here about it, and then we'll jump into our outline, which will be uh, six points um, uh, that are really just verse 16. So Paul says that the Ephesians, we need to get back to the truth of the gospel. And he starts to define what is that truth. If he's telling them, you need to get back to the truth, the, truth is, the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Well, what is the truth? What do we know? What are we supposed to uphold? And so he says in verse 16, great indeed, we confess is the mystery of godliness. Now, what is the mystery of godliness? Let's talk about that really quickly. Why is it so great? So if you just look at this very briefly and you think, well, mystery of godliness. The first time I read this, when I was younger, I thought it meant that there's this secret to becoming godly, the mystery of godliness. How can I become godly? Well, it's a secret. You got to figure it out. That's not what Paul is saying here. Uh, and and the, the word mystery, it commonly refers to something that God partially reveals and then will fully reveal later in his own timing. And uh, I was greatly helped by Pastor Sam in his book, The Mystery of Christ. And uh, he quotes G.K. Beale, and I think he has a really good way of saying this. A mystery is actually a way of communicating. It's a mode of revelation, he says. And so a mystery is not something that's always supposed to be a secret. A secret. In this context, a mystery is something that was partially revealed and then fully revealed in Christ. And that's what this is talking about. Now, where do we get this, this idea of a mystery? Let me show you from the scriptures very briefly. In Colossians 1, Paul says, the mystery is Christ in you. And that this mystery had, was hidden for ages and generations. In Ephesians 3, Paul says the mystery of Christ was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so hopefully that helps you a little bit understand what Paul is, says by the word mystery here. What does he mean by mystery? And so when we read this phrase, the mystery of godliness, he's not saying our godliness is mysterious. He's saying that, the, that our godliness is rooted in the mystery in the plan of redemption, in the gospel. That is a good way to think of this. And so we'll see the connection here that Paul's making between theology and godliness. You see, he just told us how to behave in the church, and then he gives us this beautiful hymn about the gospel. And the connection is very important for us to see. So let's get to our outline. And today we're going we're gonna to learn about six truths about Jesus Christ. Six truths about Jesus Christ. And really what it is, you can kind of see Paul's train of thought here. It's really, it's really awesome. If you, if you see it this way, Paul is talking about, here's how you behave in the church. This is very important. Here's how to be godly. By the way, that church, that is the pillar and the ground of the truth. What is the truth? The mystery of godliness. And then he launches into this hymn, but I think it's a hymn, um, proclaiming some of the basic summary truths of the gospel. And that's what I want us to center on today. And so you'll see that these six statements, some of them are about the, um, the pivotal moments of Jesus' ministry, or maybe the results of that ministry. 
And there's all this discussion. <laughs> you could do a lot of study into how, what exactly, where does this come from? What is it? Is it a creed? Is it a poem? Is it a hymn? Did Paul write it? Did someone else write it? Uh, should it be divided in three sections or two sections? And there's a lot of really interesting work that's been done. But I, I do think it's a hymn, and I'll give you really quickly two reasons why I think it's a hymn. So the very first word is the word he or who. So it's very possible, we know it refers to Jesus, right? He was manifested in the flesh. That's what it says in your, in your Bible right there in verse 16. So it doesn't say Jesus was manifested in the flesh or God the Son was manifested in the flesh. It just says who or he was manifested in the flesh. So he could be quoting from a larger hymn and picking up in the middle. That's just a possibility. This is just a suggestion, by the way, not dogmatic. And then also the very first word in every phrase in the Greek is, is rhymes. Uh, so that can help you as well. So anyways, let's get into this, and let's go through these six true things about Jesus Christ. So number one, number one, he was manifested in the flesh. He was manifested in the flesh. So what is this talking about? This is referring to the incarnation. The incarnation, that God the Son was manifested in human flesh, that he took the form of a servant, that he is Emmanuel, God with us. He was manifested in the flesh in the flesh. And I want to briefly talk about the theology here, because there's some really good theology here. And Calvin points out that this statement here preserves both the humanity and the divinity of Christ in one simple phrase. He was manifested in the flesh. Okay, by using the word flesh, Paul is saying that God the Son was truly human, that he was in flesh. And also, by using the word manifested, Paul is showing that there are two natures within Jesus. So there's not two Jesuses. There's not a human Jesus and a divine Jesus. No, there's one Jesus who is both divine and human. That's the basic doctrine about Christ. We sang Hark the Herald Angels Sing this morning. It has really good theology in that hymn. And I love the, the, the verse that says this, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, Hail the incarnate deity, Pleased with us in flesh to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. And Paul starts one, he starts out this hymn with one of the great mysteries of the faith, the incarnation. And I think, really quickly, let's clarify this, this doctrine of the incarnation, by what it does not mean. I think this might be helpful to us. So, very quickly, this does not mean that the eternal triune God, the Trinity, became man. And that might seem obvious to you. Um, I was at, I went to Biola all four years and I was, we were, it was in some chapel, and I heard someone praying. I don't think they meant to say this. I think we all are heretics accidentally many times. But they, the prayer went something like this. Father in heaven, thank you for coming to earth, becoming a man, and dying for our sins on the cross. Now, did you catch that? God the Father didn't come to earth. It's God the Son. And so it's important that we notice that it was God the Son, Jesus Christ. He was the one that came and became human. This also does not mean that God and man mixed together and created some demigod. Not 50% God and 50% human. Um, there's not this new person that's created, but God the Son was manifested in the flesh. He took on flesh, and he appeared in the world in the likeness of men. This does not mean, also, finally, that God the Son only appeared as a human. No, he was manifested in the flesh. It's a very important thing to remind us, ourselves of. He had a real human body and a real human nature, yet without sin. We know that his cheek was kissed by Judas. His face was slapped by the Roman guards. His hands and his feet were nailed to a cross, and there was a crown of thorns that was crammed onto his head. The human body, the flesh in which God the Son was manifested in, it was crucified, died, and buried. These things actually happened. And, and Peter says in 1 Peter that Christ, Christ suffered in the flesh, truly, and that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And I'll end this point with a quick quote from Spurgeon. He says, Man is royal now that Christ is human. Man is exalted since Christ is humiliated. Man may go up to God now that God has come down to man. This is great, is it not? A mystery, certainly, but great in every way. 
And I think that can give us a small clue and a hint to maybe the structure of this hymn. You see, it seems to be that the first three phrases refer to the descent and the humiliation of Christ, and the last three are about the exaltation of Christ. All right, let's move on to number two. Number two, he was vindicated in the spirit. He was vindicated in the spirit. This is a somewhat difficult phrase for translators and commentators. Um, If you have the King James or the New King James, or probably no one here has the ASV, but those translations, they don't use the word vindicated. They use another word, which is justified. You might notice that if you have, some of you might have the New King James here. Now, what's that about? Well, the Greek word is dikaio, which means to justify. It's usually translated as justification or justify or justified. And so this is somewhat of a difficult phrase. I had to ask for help on this one, too, from some of our pastors here. And, and I think this is, a, this is a helpful way to think about this. When we often think of the word justify, we think of God declaring a sinner righteous, right? That's the basic thing that at least I think of when I think of that word. The word can also have a more basic meaning, and, and it's very similar but basic. In Luke 7.35, Jesus says, wisdom is justified by her children. Okay, is Jesus saying that wisdom is declared righteous in the sight of God by her children? (laughs) That doesn't really make sense in that context. What it's really saying, what Jesus is saying, is that wisdom is proven wise by the effects that it has. It's shown to be right. It's vindicated. It's shown to be true. It's shown to be wise. So I think in this passage, when it says that he was vindicated in the spirit... The meaning is that Jesus Christ, God the Son, was vindicated in the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit, throughout Jesus' whole earthly ministry, was continually vindicating. This is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. And we see this all the way throughout Christ's ministry, do we not? We see the Holy Spirit vindicating that Jesus was who he said he was. Think about the baptism of Jesus. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove, vindicating that he is the Son of God. Uh, it's the casting out of demons, right? The Pharisees said, Jesus, you're, you have demonic power. And Jesus says, if I had demonic power, then I would not be casting out demons, for a house cannot be divided against itself. The Holy Spirit vindicates through these miracles, the various miracles in Jesus' ministry, to the healing of the sick, and to the greatest vindication of all, the resurrection. The Holy Spirit vindicates God the Son, that he was who he said he was by raising him from the dead. Romans 1 4 says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And so the resurrection truly demonstrated that Jesus was who he said he was. All right, number three. Number three. He was seen by angels. He was seen by angels. Now, this is another somewhat difficult phrase. There's kind of a divided. Uh, camp on this one. But there's two possible meanings. Briefly, I'll talk about what this could possibly mean. Okay, most, most early church fathers thought that this meant the apostles. They might be like, what? <laughs> angels? Apostles? Those are two different words. Well, the word for angel can also be used as just messenger in the Bible, rarely, but it can be used in that way. And so many commentators, especially in the early church, thought that Well, the apostles, they were messengers. They saw the resurrection and the ascension, and they went out and proclaimed the gospel. So these are the messengers that saw Jesus. That's one possible uh, translation. The other, or interpretation, the other one is just uh, angels. It could just mean angels. The actual angels saw Christ, saw his ministry, and attested that these things happened. Uh, It's really interesting to study angels in Jesus' ministry. Uh, They're very involved. Um, Pastor Sam even mentioned Uh, some this morning. Angels told Mary that she would conceive and bear a son. Uh, It was a host of angels that appeared to the shepherds and glorified God for the birth of Christ. It was angels who ministered to Christ after the temptation in the wilderness. It was an angel who appeared to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and gave him strength for the crucifixion that was awaiting him. At the resurrection, it was angels who rolled away the the stone from the grave and who announced that he was risen. Uh, It was angels that appeared at the ascension, when, uh, when the apostles are staring up into the sky, and the angels come and say, why are you staring in the sky? He is in heaven. He is not here. 
And so we see that the angels were witnesses to all these things that happened, that Jesus truly was incarnated, that he was vindicated, that he was raised from the dead, and that he ascended into heaven. And depending on which one you pick, messengers, apostles, or angels, I think there's a very similar meaning here. Both demonstrate the same thing, or something very similar, that these things happened, and there were witnesses from all levels of the created order, from humans to angels, from the visible to the invisible realms. All right, number four, number four. He was proclaimed among the nations. He was proclaimed among the nations. Uh, This is a more straightforward phrase. Jesus Christ, the gospel, was proclaimed among all the nations. Uh, In in the uh, Great Commission, Jesus says to the apostles, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And we see that this happened. The apostles went out to all the nations and they they preached the gospel um, and, and we see the gospel is preached not just to Jews, but to all peoples, to all peoples. Peter says in Acts 10, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. You see, in Acts, many of the Christians, the Jewish Christians, had a, had a big problem with Gentiles being brought into the kingdom. But God says, no, the, the Gentiles are included in the kingdom he was proclaimed among the nations. I love the passage in Revelation 7, where John says, After this I looked and I saw a multitude too large to count, from every nation and tribe and people and tongue, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. I love that, that verse. Believers from every nation, from every tongue, from every tribe. There is no partiality in the gospel. So, what is proclaiming Christ, though? the nations have to do with the mystery of godliness. What, what is the connection here? Philip Grand Ryken says, what the church is doing at this moment in history is essential to God's plan for the redemption of the world, the nations. You see, my friends here at Trinity, we are part of God's redemptive plan in saving the world, proclaiming the gospel to the nations. We, you individually are testify. You guys are witnesses that Jesus Christ has been proclaimed to the nations. And that's a beautiful thing. We are all part of the advance of the kingdom of God. All right, number five. Number five. He was believed on in the world. He was believed on in the world. Okay, not only was Jesus proclaimed to the nations, he was believed on. The message worked. It was efficacious. It was powerful. The gospel was not only preached, it had power, and people were saved. We know that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And again, this phrase right here is a historical claim. He was believed on in the world. This did happen at one point. It's still happening today. Look around you. Look to your right and to your left. You'll see other Christians um, who have been saved by God's grace, who believed on Christ in the world. And you know, even though, you know, you read the statistics of who's a Christian today in the world, and many of those people might be nominal, but isn't it just an encouragement to think about how many Christians there truly are in the world today. That is an encouragement to me. And as we read in Revelation 7, when it says that there's a multitude too large to count, that's very encouraging. Jesus Christ was believed on in the world. All right, number six, our last point. He was taken up in glory. He was taken up in glory. There is some debate about this phrase, whether it refers to the ascension of Christ or the second coming of Christ. I think it's, it's, a good to, it's safe to say that this is referring to the ascension of Christ. Christ, after being raised from the dead, was taken up in glory. He was ascended into heaven. And, and why would I say that? Well, the verb taken up, taken up into glory, it's the same word used many other places in the New Testament about the ascension. That he was taken up or he was received up into glory. And this short hymn ends with the doctrine of the ascension. We've seen how Christ incarnated and descended, and now we have seen how he has ascended. And he sits down at the right hand of the Father, and he has the name which is above every name. Praise the Lord for this short hymn. So we've looked at these six truths about Jesus Christ. We've gone through them. And remember, we want to remember that Paul, in using this hymn, using these six truths about Jesus Christ, is showing us that this is the gospel and this is the source for godliness in the church. 
and they are deeply and intricately connected. All right, I'm going to end with five observations from our text. Five observations from our text. All right, number one, the truths which all Christians believe. The truths which all Christians believe. He says, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. The Greek word there for we confess refers to something that everybody agrees on. Everyone agrees. There's no controversy here without, with common consent. We all agree. We all believe. These are truths that every Christian believes. You can't get away with denying the incarnation or the resurrection and say that you're a Christian. You're outside the faith. This is the simple gospel. And, and this is a good summary of the gospel. This is a good verse to memorize, I think. Uh, this, these six truths about Jesus Christ. It's a very, very short summary. A summary. Uh, Spurgeon summarizes this verse in this way. He says, Jesus, the Son of God, has come into the world as a man to save men. He has bled and died. He is proclaimed and preached. He is to be received and believed in. He has gone up to glory to re- prepare a place for them that trust him, and that is all. This is the simple gospel. This is what you must believe to be a Christian. All right, number two, our second observation is that precise theology is important. Precise theology is important. Paul uses his words very carefully here. He was manifested in the flesh. We saw that earlier, how it preserves the humanity and the divinity of Christ. Words do matter. We should stand by that. Words matter. And you'll hear phrases today like, no creed but the Bible, or doctrine divides and love unites. And, you know, we should firmly hold the solar scripture. Our confession should, with our own conscience, be drawn from the word of God. Okay, we agree with that. And also, we should present the truth with love. We shouldn't be arrogant in our presentation. And maybe that's what those uh, phrases are really more pointed at. But, if you say, no creed but the Bible, and no, we don't want to talk about doctrine, we just want to talk about love, you're undermining precise theology. We should hold the precise theology. That is good. Words do matter. All right, number three, number three. It is shameful to believe the correct doctrine and live in a way that undermines it. It is shameful to believe the correct doctrine and live in a way that undermines it. You see, Paul has shown here how godliness comes from the gospel. And those who affirm the truth about the gospel but live in a way that is against what they believe, that is a shameful thing. And we should not do that in our own lives. We need to repent if that is us. You know what? We believe that we hold to the most accurate theology. We do. The best and most accurate theology. But if that is so, should not our lives be marked with charity and humility and a spirit of grace? You see, the gospel should lead us to godliness. And sometimes it leads us to arrogance. And we should guard our hearts against that tendency. J.I. Packer says this very well. He says, if our theology is, does not quicken the conscience and soften the heart, it actually hardens both, has a negative effect on you if, gospel, if the theology does not lead you to godliness. If it does not encourage the commitment of faith, it reinforces the detachment of unbelief. If it fails to promote humility, it will feed pride. And we need to guard our hearts against believing the correct doctrine, but not living it out. All right, number four. Number four, we're almost done. Godliness is rooted in the gospel. Godliness is rooted in the gospel. We've already talked about this several times already. My friends, if you try to become godly and holy and root your efforts in yourself, you will fail. You will fail. You do not have the strength to become godly by your own means. And you know, many times, we as Christians, we get distracted by the circumstances of our life or the sin in our lives or trials in our life, And we forget to look to Christ and the gospel as the source for our godliness. We are like the Galatians who, having begun by the Spirit, are trying to become perfected in the flesh. We need to also guard our hearts against this. Maybe you're here today. And maybe you hear the the call to be godly, as Paul says, to behave in the church. But you can't seem to overcome a certain sin or your circumstances or a trial in your life. Maybe you feel like your anger is just out of control and you can't control it. Maybe you feel like you've lost your battle with lust. Maybe you feel like you have a problem with lying and you cannot, you, you cannot get over this. You can't overcome the struggle. Maybe you've been hurt seriously and deeply 
and you feel like everything's been taken away from you, and you just feel overwhelmed by the circumstances in your life. Well, my friends, we can learn from Paul that you need to look away from these circumstances and away from yourself. Look to Christ for the strength to be godly. You see, this Christ, the one who was incarnated, the one who was vindicated in the spirit, who was seen by angels, proclaimed and believed on in the world, and taken up into glory, he resides in you by his Holy Spirit. He is so much greater than your circumstances or a habit of sin in your life. Look away from yourself and look to Christ, and only then will you find the strength for godliness. And uh, Ligon Duncan, he uses the illustration of a telescope. If you're so focused on your circumstances and your sinful habits, and that's what you're obsessing over, you're like looking through the telescope at God the wrong way. You flipped it. And God looks small and your problems look massive and great. You need to turn that telescope around and see that however real your problems are, they are dwarfed in the, the light of the glory of Christ. Look away from yourself and look to Christ. Let us root our efforts at godliness in the gospel. All right, lastly, number five, number five. Simply this, the love of God in the gospel. The love of God in the gospel. Think of the love of God displayed in these six truths about Jesus Christ, the, the gospel, the plan of redemption. This is the God who gave his only son to die. This is Jesus Christ who, although he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And if you're a Christian here today, Remember the love of God displayed in the gospel. Meditate on that this season of Christmas. Pray on that. Meditate on that. Thank the Lord and praise him for what he has done for you. And as Paul in Ephesians 1, remember that God the Father chose you before the foundation of the world and he predestined you. That God the Son achieved salvation for you by making satisfaction for your sins on the cross. And that God the Spirit changes us from the inside out and makes our Christian life a present reality. Praise the God, praise the Lord, praise the Lord for his salvation. And if you're here today, and you're not a Christian, and there are some of you here today, you know who, I, you know who, you're, who I'm talking about right now. You don't know Christ, you have not bowed the knee to him, you don't love him. I ask you, who is your God? Who do you worship? What do you worship? Because everyone does worship something. Maybe you worship the God of materialism, of stuff. You're always trying to get more things. But my friend, you know that that will never satisfy you. You will always want more. Maybe you worship the God of desire or pleasure. But you know that will not satisfy you as well. Maybe you say there's no God, and I worship the God of fate or the cold statistics of science. My friends, see the God who is love. See the love of God displayed in the gospel. Paul says in Titus 3, 4 through 7, but when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Praise the Lord for his kindness and his goodness. If you do not worship this one true God, see that he is truly good, that he is truly loving, and that he is truly kind. And according to his mercy, the Bible says that if you believe and you trust in him, that he will, he will save you. I'll end with this hymn that I love. And it says this, Man of sorrows, what a name, for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners, to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have sent your only Son to die for us, Lord. And Lord, we worship and we praise Jesus Christ, the one who was incarnated, the one who was vindicated, the one who Lord, who was proclaimed and believed on in the world and seen by angels and taken up in glory. Lord, we praise Jesus Christ and we thank you for the gift of faith that your Holy Spirit has given to us. Lord, we pray that our godliness, Lord, would be rooted in the gospel, that what we believe would truly translate into the way that we live, Lord. 
Lord, I pray that we would not be hypocrites, Lord, that we would truly practice what we preach. And Lord, I pray for any of those who do not know you here, Lord. I pray that they would look and see the love of God in the gospel. Lord, I pray that you would change their hearts even now from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh and that they would see the exceeding riches of Jesus Christ and come to him. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.